Hello, welcome to Kentish Tales and Tales of Kent. Stories for people from this wonderful county or from further afield. So you know the story of Thomas Beckett, uh, the Archbishop who was killed. You were taught this in a history class. And you were listening, and you weren't just coming up with like your ideal formations for championship manager or picking bogeys and wiping them underneath the table. But just in case you weren't paying attention, here's the story again. Thomas Beckett came from a lowly background and rose all the way up to become Lord Chancellor of England under King Henry II. Henry and Thomas Beckett became bosom buddies, and so Henry was happy to make Thomas Archbishop of Canterbury. However, at this point, Henry and Thomas ceased to be best friends as it turned out that Thomas loved the church more than he loved Henry. Thomas was forced to flee the country, but then eventually the two of them kissed and made up and overcame their problems and their differences. Thomas returned to England, but as soon as he got there, he started stirring up trouble again. And it was at this point that Henry said, who will rid me of this turbulent priest, apparently. Hearing this, four knights descended on Canterbury Cathedral 800 years ago, and murdered Thomas. For this video, we're interested in what Thomas Beckett was doing five days before he was murdered. So it was that Thomas Beckett found himself in Strood in 1170. It was Christmas Eve and he was heading from London all the way down to Canterbury. And as he meandered through the town, no doubt gazing at the various different decorations, not that there were decorations, but just imagine, he came across a large group of people, for the people of Strood did not like Thomas Beckett. Whether this was because he was from over in Canterbury and they owed their loyalties more to Rochester, or it was a Kentish man, man of Kent thing, we don't know. But as the crowd surrounded Thomas, they started shouting at him and having a gun at him and accusing him of various different things. And then one man of Strood, or Strudish man, depending on how you feel about these things, took out a long dagger and cut off the tale of Thomas's horse. Now, obviously, Thomas was a man of God, so you'd expect him to turn the other cheek. But really, Thomas wasn't that kind of man of God. So, he raised himself on his newly tailless horse and said to the people of Strood, I curse thee forevermore that you will all have tails. So if you've ever been to Strood and looked around, that's the reason they all have tales. That story was one of, uh, from one of his biographers, William Fitzstephen. A slightly less gory version was told by Jocelyn, another one of uh, the people who described uh, Thomas's life. And they said, instead of it being that somebody had locked off the tail of his horse, they said instead the people of Strood, being quite malicious, had tied fish tails to the whole of Thomas's men's horses. Now nobody likes the smell of fish, so that's why the people of Strood have uh, tails. Things, however, took a turn for the weird. It wasn't just the people of Strood that everyone else thought had tails. For 500 years after Thomas Beckett's death, Finn Morrison reported how, on his travels in the Netherlands, whenever somebody from England was not paying a bill, they were referred to as leaving a tail end. Thomas Fuller, who was also travelling in the 17th century, noted how the people of Kent all throughout the continent were known to have tails. Bishop John Bale reported an even more worrying trend when he said, an Englishman now cannot travel in any other land by way of merchandise or any other honest occupying, but is most contemptuously thrown in his teeth that all Englishmen have tails. In fact, as early as the 1190s, other crusading knights from France and Germany reported how English knights all had tails. So, Rochester, in the 13th century, the Chronicles of England were published, and this told of a former traveller in these lands known as St. Augustine, who was also of religious persuasion. He brought Christianity to England for the second time. Romans. It was said that when he visited Rochester, what happened to him was he preached the word of God to all of the pagan heathenish people there. And it was said 
The pagan scorned him and threw ray tails at him, so that his mantle was all hanging with ray tails. And for even greater humiliation, they threw on him the guts of rays and fish. And at that good man, St. Augustine was very angry and prayed to God that all the children who were to be born thereafter in the city of Rochester should have tails. So maybe the people of Rochester and also the people of Strood have a real dislike of religious authority figures and some kind of perverse fetish about fish tails. If that's the original story, how did all these things get mixed up together? The tales of Rochester and St Augustine, Strood, Canterbury. Well, what we do know is the Brock family, they owned a lot of land over in Strood. And we also know that the Brock family, they were given lands um, from Thomas when he'd fallen out with Henry II. Now, the problem was, when Thomas returned, having been forgiven by uh, Henry and having made kissed and made up, he came back to England and fell out with the Brocks, saying that they had misused his land and burnt some of his crops. In revenge, the Brocks turned up on that land and stole his hunting dogs and killed his deer. Things escalated when one of the Brocks took Thomas Beckett's prize horse and cut off the tail. The horse was brought to Thomas Beckett and he couldn't help but understand what the Brocks were trying to tell him. Thomas mentioned the atrocity in his sermon on Christmas Day in Canterbury Cathedral. He also excommunicated Robert and Ranulph de Brock, something he had done previously, and which would be one of the reasons why Henry II would fly into a rage and demand someone do something about the Archbishop. Thomas knew he was on borrowed time, as he stated how one Archbishop of Canterbury had been killed before, and how it was only perhaps a matter of time before another one was. He probably did not realise how quickly he would be proved right. It was only four days later that knights broke into the cathedral and slew him at his very own altar. If you've enjoyed this tale and want to learn more, why not click below and you can find a reading list. Um, or you might want to follow me on Facebook or Twitter and I would hope that you would like and subscribe as well. Thank you.